Welcome back to Summer Science Live. We've heard from all sorts of different scientists today on the science that they've brought to the exhibition this year. We've heard about how scientists studying the movement of animals in the water can help us reduce carbon dioxide emissions from shipping and it can help us study how animals are moving around our oceans. The Royal Society has a very long history in studying our oceans and I'm joined on the sofa now by Keith Moore, the Society's head librarian, to tell us about the exhibition that you've brought to the Royal Society, which is a, it's a collaboration between Google Arts and Culture. Um, tell us a bit more about your exhibition. Uh, well, it's about fish, mm -hmm. uh, or rather the kind of long history of marine expeditions, some of them sponsored by the Royal Society, uh, starting in the 17th century and moving as far as the 20th. So we want to tell the story of how people began to understand the, the depths of the sea and the ways they went about it. And how, why did we first become interested in this and how did we first start studying it? Well, uh, in the early Royal Society, and the organisation was uh, started in 1660, um, quite a few of the early scientists were, were interested in what was happening under the water. Obviously, uh, fishermen and mariners knew the surface of the oceans very well. Uh, but people like Robert Hooke, the Society's curator of experiments, began to design equipment so that they could start to see what was happening underneath the sea. Uh, so Hooke designs a, a water sampling device. Edmund Halley, whom we, we tend to know better as a, an astronomer. The, 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 exactly <laughs> right. Um, he designs a type of diving bell and a diving suit, mostly for uh, rec reclamation. Uh, but uh, you can see that they began to get interested in uh, other things down there. Mm -hmm. And Halley, particularly when he becomes a sea captain, he, he leads expeditions to the South Atlantic, um, he begins to start collecting fish, drawing them and presenting them to the Royal Society. Fantastic. And what could this, these fish tell them about the oceans? What the Society was interested in in the beginning was trying to classify life. I mean, we're very familiar with mm -hmm. this kind of concept now. Um, but they wanted to try and record everything in the natural world and, mm -hmm. and give it names, classify it uh, and be able to identify it. The leading figures in this, this kind of area in the Royal Society were two naturalists called Francis uh, Willoughby and John Ray. They uh, together uh, did expeditions and uh, collecting visits uh, in Britain and in Europe. And they decided that uh, John Ray would produce a, a history of plants, Willoughby would look after uh, animals, and, and collectively they, they'd produce this, these great works of, of natural history. Now, unfortunately, Willoughby died, so the work fell upon John Ray. And the Royal Society supported him in this, and he uh, produced one of the famous books of the early Royal Society, which was uh, The History of Fishes. The History of Fishes. So what did that contain? It contained um, identifications of marine life. So previously, uh, if something swam in the ocean, it was classified as a fish. Right. Uh, so if it was a crocodile, it was a fish. Okay. Uh, if it was a whale, it was a fish. Mm -hmm. So uh, what John Ray was trying to do was to uh, give names to things, mm -hmm. but also exclude things as well. Yeah. Whales did sneak into his book, I should say. <laughs> they, are, they are mammals, we know. <clears throat> but uh, he, he begins to uh, look at previous illustrations in, in fish books. Uh, the Royal Society had its own museum, which collected objects, including fish. <clears throat> and he produces this great work, which tries to capture all the fish in the sea, or at least all the ones they knew about at that time. And uh, I have the Royal Society's copy right here. Wow, can we take a look? We can take a look. And you can see immediately, oh, it's yes. a very beautiful thing, and it has some fabulous illustrations in here of pretty much anything you can think of that was known at the period. Wow. And was it the explorers, the scientists themselves, that were doing these illustrations, or did they collaborate with illustrators for that? 
Uh, they collaborated, so yeah. the, there would be original illustrations, and sometimes they were taken from other books. Uh, the Royal Society had some fish of its own, of course, and these things would be sent off to the engravers, and the engravers would produce these, these wonderful uh, copper plate prints. Society had a bit of a history of this. I mean, one of the great books that we published in the early days was Micrographia, which had wonderful illustrations of uh, mi microscopic uh, life, amongst other things. So they thought that a, a wonderfully illustrated book like this would be a runaway bestseller. And um, they decided to print lots of copies of it. It didn't quite work out that way. <laughs> Go on, tell me more. <laughs> uh, this is a book that uh, is generally considered to almost have bankrupted the Royal Society. Really? Uh, the Royal Society paid for the, the printing of it. Uh -huh. So there is text, as you can see in the beginning. Yeah. And it uh, got sponsors to um, uh, uh, give money to produce each of the copper plates. And, and very often you can see the names uh, of the sponsors just here. So this one is Samuel Pepys, who is president of the Royal Society. Mm -hmm. and, and he sponsored lots of plates in this right. book. But it cost so much that uh, the Royal Society was in some difficulties. Yeah. And they couldn't sell copies fast enough. That they, in the end, were beginning to uh, use copies as a kind of currency. So they, they tried to pay people with with, <laughs> with copies of uh, the history of fishes. Um, and uh, it, it, one of the reasons it's famous is because. Isaac Newton's great work, Principia Mathematica, was also being printed around this time, yeah. and the Royal Society couldn't fund that work because it had spent so much money on, on this one. Wow, so we nearly didn't have one of Newton's greatest works because right. of this yeah. book, The History yeah, yeah. of Fishes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and we have an account book here from the Royal Society, so this is the manuscript accounts of the period. This is the 1680s, and uh, you can see rows and rows of figures mm. here of the money they were spending uh, to a whole host of engravers. Uh, there's uh, at least seven or eight on this page alone where they're farming out work to produce uh, the history of fishes and uh, the, uh, the money's going yeah. out in this column here. Goodness, wow. But presumably the Royal Society you know, stood by the decision that this type of work you know, documenting these animals was was worthwhile. You know, this was important yes. scientific work. Yeah. So this is, is pre Linnaeus, who, who we know very well for, for classifying the animal kingdom. Um, but yes, the Royal Society not only paid to print the book, but quite a few fellows got involved in the, the process of trying to uh, classify the fish involved, uh, trying to eliminate some of them. So they Ray had a mini research team around him of fellows who knew a little bit about uh, natural history and, and they helped to refine the work and, and get it through the press. Mm. So thinking then about science in the modern day, you know, this summer science exhibition is all about celebrating the recent research that's been going on. Where does this sort of work fit in that story and is it still relevant to researchers today? I, I think it is relevant. Obviously this is a, very much a paper exercise and the exhibition we have uh, in the building is to do with scientists not just sitting in an office and, and, and looking at this kind of thing but actually going out and finding out about the natural world. Uh, and uh, this is important. There's a long history of great voyages of discovery and uh, many, many of them were to do with uh, finding out about marine life. Um, we know uh, probably the most famous one is, is Charles Darwin's Beagle Voyage. Yes. Now we, uh, we tend to associate that with Galapagos Islands and, and Darwin's finches, but Darwin was, was collecting fish as well. He, he, he collected many specimens. The great 19th century expedition was HMS Challenger, uh, which uh, occurred in the 1870s. It was first properly Oceanographic, oceanographic expedition. Uh, the Royal Society helped set it up and it sailed the uh, world's oceans for years, collecting specimens, finding about the nature of the sea, how it changed at depths, what the uh, uh, sea floor was composed of. Um, so it really it was a big moment in, in the history of science. And uh, 
Today, of course, we're interested in the oceans for the impact that man is having on them. So uh, many of the 20th century expeditions that society is involved in to the Great Barrier Reef and, and to um, uh, the Seychelles, uh, they're important because you can see, you can be, begin to see changes in those environments. So the uh, uh, people at Aldabra are looking at plastics in the ocean, how much they can collect. And obviously, you know, um, uh, a few years ago, they, they weren't there. Uh, the Great Barrier Reef Expedition told us a lot about coral, so it's a benchmark for that. Uh, and of course we're very concerned today about uh, acidity in the ocean, plastic pollution, death of coral and, and many other things. So uh, it's, it's important that we look back on these expeditions to see what the oceans were like in comparison to what they are now. Yeah, the oceans are changing so rapidly that for us to have, I guess, this sort of timestamp to suggest how they were that you know hundreds of years ago, it allow it gives us that benchmark to then compare the rate of change now and um, and sort of the importance of making sure that we are you know preserving these creatures that we know yeah. have been in our oceans. And of course, the deep oceans are still largely unexplored, yeah. uh, and therefore uh, it wasn't just uh, John Ray and Francis Willoughby finding new things, uh, there are new things still to be found in yeah. the seas, so it's uh, worth preserving them until we find out what is there. Yeah, definitely. So let's talk a bit about then. So you're, you're the society's head librarian, is that that's the correct job that's title? Correct, yeah. yeah. Um, these look incredibly, in an incredibly good nick. <laughs> yes. What are the challenges with um, you know, preserving these types of artefacts? Um, from this period, uh, paper is pretty good actually. Mm -hmm. So um, this is handmade uh, paper. It will last a thousand years if it's kept in the right conditions. So uh, we try to keep it in the right conditions. Mm -hmm. So the Royal Society has a huge collection of both uh, printed books and manuscript material going back to 1660 and even beyond that because uh, Royal Society fellows have collected manuscripts over the years, things of interest to science. These are kept in uh, Envir environmentally controlled <laughs> stores, so they kept it uh, standard uh, temperature and humidity, uh, and the, the air in there is is cleaned. Um, of course, uh, things deteriorate over the years. Fellows have used the books in our yeah. collections, so they do need rebinding and repair from time to mm -hmm. time, uh, and we we do do that. But today. The movement is definitely towards uh, not just keeping these things in archive stores, but getting them out to where people can see them, not just in the search rooms, yeah. uh, but online as well. So we're uh, digitizing material very, very hard at the moment. And uh, we hope to launch uh, all of the manuscript content of the Philosophical Transactions uh, in uh, January 2023. And that will include unpublished material and things like referees' reports on uh, what one scientist thought about another scientist's <laughs> paper. They're quite fun, those ones, because uh, there's nothing like a good argument between scientists. Definitely, <laughs> and yeah, and hopefully providing some comfort to scientists today that even the greats had their work criticised sometimes. That's right, <laughs> even, even the big ones had, had papers rejected, so uh, you shouldn't feel too bad about <laughs> We're it. We're all in this together. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, Keith Moore, thank you so much for talking to me about your job as um, head librarian at the Royal Society and for telling us the story of the history of fishes. Thank you very much, and it's great to get this, these, these, these things out there.